this device had a really different rise to power than this device. And I think the iPod kind of explains the entire story. We were here today uh, with the promise of unveiling a breakthrough digital device uh, that's not a Mac. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We think we got a breakthrough in user interfaces to where it is now accessible to everybody to have a thousand songs and find them and navigate them faster if you only have 10 or 15 uh, on a much simpler device. A big breakthrough. Apple's legendary ease of use of the iPod in electronics device. Boom. That's iPod. I have one right here in my pocket. There he is, right there. If I told you that I had a $700 device today that was beautiful, portable, and played a thousand songs that you could carry in your pocket, would you take me up on that offer? That's how much the iPod would have cost if you adjusted for inflation today. Um, so why did people buy the thing, right? It doesn't really make a lot of sense in a lot of ways. There's this idea that I have that people bought the iPod because it was an application in itself. If you think about it, the iPod was the first device that Apple released uh, in the kind of succession of major devices for them. The Apple II, the Mac, and then the iPod that didn't support a platform for applications beyond the software that they already created for it. That's why a lot of people talk about how Apple reinvented itself with the iPod because it turned them into a consumer electronics company, not a computer company. And that is the foundational and fundamental shift that is so profound that needs to be investigated more, I think. Now, when people talk about design, they talk about form following function. And I didn't fully get that when it was first described to me, but I think I get it now. That the physicality, the actual creation of a device in great design affords itself to what that device can do and should be and what it truly is in its essence. It's a very mindful and meditative process to get to the point where something is well designed. And the iPod was just that. They saw that people wanted to carry their music with them, starting with the Walkman or portable radios. And they eventually found that with the technology and with the market that they cornered in terms of their supply chain, that they could create this unique device and apply their design acumen to a problem that just elevated the entire industry's expectations and the entire market's expectations of what they should expect out of a music player. So the iPod turned the Mac company into the iPod company, and it totally changed the public's ability to understand what Apple was. And people saw it as the, you know, Apple stores as the iPod stores, for example. Now, in the past, I've traced the innovations on Apple's computing platforms. I wouldn't call iPod a computing platform. It was a dongle, essentially, to sell Macintosh computers originally, right? But that started all the way back with, you know, the Apple I, probably, but especially the Apple II. We talked about how it went into an enthusiast market in the past and how those enthusiasts developed things that then sold it to the general market. That was the spreadsheet originally with the Apple II. And how the Macintosh went into an enthusiast market, it was aimed for the general public, but it started off with Apple enthusiasts and eventually became something that was designed, <laughs> that, that became sold, that started to be sold because of desktop publishing applications. Again, something designed by enthusiasts, a market powered by enthusiasts. The iPod was not that. It really was not that. Everybody loved music. It was a better version of it, and it started off expensive but got more affordable as time went on. So what about the iPhone? I've kind of remarked several times about how the iPhone was different than everything else Apple had done before. 
and many people have said this. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here, but I'm trying to meditate on why that is the case. And last week I talked about how the App Store might be the reason why. But actually, I think it's a little bit different than that. The App Store is what brought... It, it was the killer app. It was the thing that sold it to the rest of the market because it opened this gateway for those developers to create the application for the market so that there was an app for that, so that people would want this device in the long run. But people were still lusting after the iPhone right after the launch. The general public was lusting after the iPhone, a computing platform in some ways, after the launch, in a way that was different than the Mac, and even in a way that built on the success of the iPod. Now, if the iPod's form followed its function, the phone did the same thing. It took two things that every person had carrying around with them, their cell phone and their iPod, both in their pocket, right next to their wallet, and it combined it into one device that made a better version of both of them. And in that way, the iPhone, like the iPod, was an application in itself. It was a phone and it was an iPod. Those were two of the three things that Jobs sold uh, the audience on when he announced the device. And that's where the Vision Pro and the iPhone kind of differ from one another. The Vision Pro doesn't know what it is quite yet. It's sold as an entertainment device. It's sold as a work device, but it, it, does, it doesn't really have an identity. And this has been the, the, the method that uh, Tim Cook has taken in his time as the CEO of Apple. So if the iPhone was a killer app in itself, what is the Vision Pro supposed to do? What's it good for? Well, I think they think that you're right, that this will be like a, a new Mac or a new iPhone and last, I don't know how long the iPhone will last, but 17 years for a phone seems like a long time. So pretty good, yeah. That's what I think they think they're embarked on. And they're very realistic. They knew they know this. I, I we don't have the numbers yet, but they know that this one is gonna sell less than a million in its first year and all of that. They don't expect millions of people to go out and buy a thirty five hundred dollar thing which you with a battery that lasts two hours and is separate from the device and you know, all the other things. On the other hand, they think what they like to call spatial computing is a real thing and has a lot of potential, even though every major possible developer has refused to build something for it. <laughs> that was actually true on the Mac too, by the way. Microsoft and Adobe were the only ones that built anything for it. And, then and so I think in that way that Vision Pro is not a lot like the iPhone. I think that the app story is much more important on the Vision Pro than it was on the iPhone and of course on the iPod. The iPhone was a killer app in itself. The Vision Pro is not. And Apple has had to decide what this general purpose computer, the thing designed to be a general purpose computer for spatial computing, where those markets are gonna land. With the Apple II, it was enthusiasts. With the Mac, it was supposed to be knowledge workers. And with the Vision Pro, it's like kind of entertainment and kind of work. I don't really know. It's really difficult to tell where it's going to land because the thing that always decides a computing platform is its killer app. And that's not something that you can predict because you don't know what the form of the device is going to mean for what it's good for when developers get their hands on it.